the simple way of seeing it, like if you what point of inflection is, is go around to the senior leaders of your team and ask them and just look them in the eye and says, if we doubled sales, how would you feel? And whoever looks the most stressed is the one you need to talk to. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm, Elevate IQ. Planning through growth inflection points is difficult. You have to figure out how to find revenue and then if you are not able to fulfill the demand, the growth may fire back. Planning for growth requires you to build your multi-year sales and operating plan. But the most crucial part is its execution. The more alignment you have across your cross-functional groups, the easier and more natural the growth will feel without growing pains. In today's episode, we invited an expert panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn who brings significant finance, sales, operations planning, logistics, and warehouse expertise. But most importantly, a manufacturer and distributor who has been part of the growth journey for her company from $10 million to $200 million and experienced it firsthand. With that, Let's get to the conversation. Hey guys, welcome to the show. So just to start with, we are going to be starting with the introduction, the way the panel is structured. Every panelist bring a very specific expertise to the forum. Aaron brings a very strong financial expertise. Tim brings very strong expertise from the warehouse perspective. And Ryan has a lot of expertise on the TMS. Paul brings uh, deep expertise in the manufacturing lean, continuous improvement. And Stephanie is the real manufacturer or the distributor who runs a real manufacturing or distribution company. Let's start with the intros. So, Aaron, do you want to start with your intro? Sure. Uh, Aaron Spool. I'm a partner at uh, Adventist Advisory Group. We help uh, mid-sized companies with their you know, finance uh, controller and CFO needs through our on-demand teams. So I, I can go on if you want, uh, but I just figured we wanted a brief intro. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that intro. Next, I'm going to move to Stephanie. Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely, and excited to be here, Sam. Um, my name is Stephanie Schrader. I have worked for two decades in the company. Actually, one of the company that I work in now is Pride Sports, and we have been on a growth curve, Sam, where we have acquired four different companies within a short time period. So I come from a manufacturing and distribution background, and my actual role has been in the procurement and supply chain arenas within the Pride Sports Company that I've been with for 14 years, but others previous to that as well. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that intro. Tim, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Tim Harrison, I uh, have about 15 years of experience in the warehouse automation space, and not only warehouse, but also in manufacturing environments, specifically in automated storage and retrieval systems and inventory control software. And uh, also the parallel to that, was uh, building sales operations and go-to-market strategies for different manufacturers. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Tim. Paul, do you want to introduce next? Yeah, sure. Paul Serafino, my company's Accelerated Journey, and it's a it's a coaching company that I started. So what I do is I, I coach executives and leaders in various size organizations, a lot of manufacturing companies, big and small. And that's my background is is predominantly manufacturing. And what I do now is help leadership and upper management in those organizations to basically work with the individual so that they're no longer the the constraint or the bottleneck to growth so that they can actually become the one that creates it, fosters it, drives it, and leads it. Okay, amazing. Ryan, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Ryan Wicklum. I am the founder and president of TriPeak Solutions, which is a supply chain optimization and uh, also business development company. It's been a wild combination of both, but I've uh, been doing it for about, uh, about four years off and on, getting to the point where it's a full-time full-time journey at this point. So hey, happy to be here and I'm, I'm looking to learn 
much as I can for my fellow uh, panelists. Okay, amazing. Thanks, guys. So just to kick things off, and obviously we need to have uh, the budget ready before we can be ready for growth. So obviously you are going to be my finance guy, and you are going to be walking us through the PNL of different stages of growth. So do you want to start with uh, talking about different inflection points that you have seen with respect to your IT budget? So typically, if you look at the market, there is a saying that, you know what, you should be keeping roughly 3 to 5% of your revenue for IT, digital transformation, anything and everything that is going to be digital related. But as far as my experience goes, that's very rarely true. Across the inflection points, I don't know if, if the larger companies are going to plan it that way. We have one of the panelists that is going to be on um, the other shows that we are going to host on LinkedIn. His name is Tom Rodden. And he has run a very large company, which is roughly $3 billion medical device company. And his IT budget was roughly, what, $80 million or something like that, something closer to that. So again, that's not necessarily 3 to 5%. I don't know if that is, everything is included in, 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 in that budget. But majority of the time, we are not going to have companies that are spending 3 to 5%. So in your experience, when you have worked with these companies, what kind of percentages that you have seen when you plan for IT budget? And as a CFO, what is going to be your recommendation when you recommend these companies across the inflection points? So I would say first, there actually is no hard and fast rule of percent. I, I think that on an aggregate, you could say that, but I take a, a non-spreadsheet view of budgets, more of a practical view, and as a very much, I, I call it outcome focused. I boil down any IT spend back to way back in business school, so 100 years ago. When I was in business school, I remember taking an advanced Excel course. So can't you can't be you can't be in finance unless you take advanced Excel. And sorry, it's prerequisite. And they uh, they said, listen, you're going to be pestered by a whole bunch of IT heads, and they're going to want the newest and best technology out there. And the number one reason they're going to want the new and best technology out there is because that's going to advance their career. It says, say no. <laughs> <laughs> says, 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 unless it, and now he didn't use the following. He didn't, he didn't talk about the theory constraints. He didn't talk about throughput. There was no the goal. There's no Eli gold. All this is incredibly important. I will sign up for that in a heartbeat. But it says only upgrade, only get the stuff if you absolutely need it. You can get pretty far with older technology. Now that might not be, uh, <laughs> that might not be what everyone wants to hear here, but I, I find that we could spend this entire time about cost overruns, how when you implement something, it never fits exactly, how the UAT didn't work out, all those other things. But from a budgetary perspective, I go for outcome focus. What are you actually attempting to do? Cause it's not about, it's not about just the expenses. It's about what's the company going to look like afterwards? Cause a real finance person really thinking isn't a budgetary person. We're not talking about, oh, did you, are you the program person who met the, the actual uh, budget overruns? What you need to think about is what's this company going to go like in the future with this technology spend? Is it, and, and what's going to be the impact and how do we know there's going to be success? And then build your case there because I, you're not going to get past me. I mean, you could override me as a CFO, but you're not going to get past me unless I understand the exact business impact and what we're going to look like in the future. Because that's also going to affect who are we going to hire, right? Who we, uh, what type of, uh, you know, do we, uh, there's, there's more spend than just the implementation costs. There might be, you might need new support staff. You also might need, this might enable you, to, I, like, it might enable you to do a whole bunch of, you know, new supply chain things. You need new supply chain analysts. It's a whole bunch, there's a, a very, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated answer. And it's so it boils down to there's no such thing as just X percent for tech spend. Think about the outcome focus. Yeah. But so I don't know if you guys are going to have any thoughts. Uh, Tim, Stephanie, I'm actually going to open up the floor if you have any any thoughts or comments. Uh, but from my perspective, I think we need to plan the budget. Right. Uh, we still need to have some sort of planning cool. for IT. I, I know that if I'm the CFO, I would probably not buy the technology if that is not really communicating the business value or not adding the business value. But without technology, it's going to be very hard to scale. If you are a really small organization oh. running manual processes, then you don't have to worry about it. But for the most part, you have to have some sort of plan for your systems and IT and, and digital. So oh. what will be your, your thought process? How would you plan, let's say, if you are doing the yearly budget? So, Aaron, I don't know if you're going to have any follow-up oh. comments there. So from, I guess from a budgetary plan perspective, You've got the classic case is your business as usual, like what's going to take to keep everything going. And then it, and, the, and then, the, and then there's the plan for any type of changes, but tech can mean a lot of things. I mean, tech could be 
if you're a, if you're a, you know, a product based company, you know, it's the tech to support the product. I mean, that's kind. Of, it, there's a whole bunch of there's could be you could be all right. I have a digital I have a digital product set that I'm selling. All right, so that that's technically tech spend as well. If you're talking about tech infrastructure, I would say it goes back to the budget is the last thing that happens. The first and foremost is the operating plan and the sales plan. Solve for that first. Eventually, you can solve for what's this going to cost. But that's why that's why I'm kind of being cagey here because. If you start the conversation with finance, you've already lost. It's, it's, you, I, I, I come in afterwards. An important step, yes, but why are you spending your money? And that's all go back to outcome focus. The budgetary stuff, that's the easy stuff. And get yourself a good program manager, you know, crack the whip, making sure that you don't have cost overruns, making sure that everything is aligned. That's all, P, that's all PMO, project management organization stuff. But in the end, it, but the budget is the last thing I think of. I, I want to think about, like, if I'm thinking about tech spend, I think about ERP. I think about digital transformation. Yeah. That whole that whole side. I'm thinking about outcome focused. Why am I doing this, and what is the eventual goal? Because I, I tell you this. I bet you. I if, if I give you just if from a finance perspective, we're playing just the finance game. If I had a scenario in which I could hire five very low cost people to run a manual process, and then hire another five even lower cost people than that to do error checks, versus a multi million dollar ERP implementation that the odds are is going to have a cost over and what is it eighty five percent of ERPs are are, are are don't are imp, are not implemented correctly. The, there's a there's a the ship graveyard of hunted old ghost ERP systems out there way strips out right. So if I had a choice to be manual and actually know that it works might be inefficient but I know that it works versus millions upon millions of dollars that I'm going to spend into a black hole of nothingness. I'm choosing man. Sorry. So. So I mean, I, I'll go into it's just like go back to what am I going to use this for, and then everything else will come to it. Right. So here, just to align our understanding, number one, if this is going to be related to the product, we are not talking about that no, here. We are talking about business processes. We are talking about how we can plan for scale through inflection points. And Stephanie, now I'm actually going to move to you, right? So uh, since you have grown from, I don't know, I mean, see, you have been with your company for the last 15 years. Again, manufacturing and distribution are very different business overall. The way the business yeah. model works, the way their financials work, the, the kind of you know, needs they are going to have from the system and technology perspective. So let's say if you are planning for a company that is doing $10 million versus planning for a company that is doing $25 million versus a, you are doing planning for $100 million, the planning is going to be very different. The system needs are going to be very different. The kind of people you are going to need in the organization is going to be very different. So how would you plan for this? If you don't plan, then it's going to be really hard. You cannot simply go that, you know what, today I'm 10 million and I'm simply trying to get to 20 million somehow. It's going to be really hard. And that's how majority of the SMB companies struggle with. So Stephanie, you have a lot of experience in supply chain planning. So how would you plan, let's say, if you're going from 10 to 25 50. Well, and I can even take it a couple steps further, Sam, and, and tell you how we're actually, how we have gone from, our company has gone from about an $85, $86 million company as of two weeks ago to an over $200 million company today. So literally overnight, this happened. And there was there was a span of time where you had that you could plan for this, that you knew we're in an acquisition mode. It looks like this is going to happen. However, it really happened so fast that now we are in that feeling that inflection period where we have been hit with this substantial growth in the distribution side, really more than manufacturing side, but we are both. And that's when it really hits you what you have done correctly, what you haven't done correctly. And that's where a lot of that learning comes in. If you don't have the planning that's been done, and to Aaron's point, when it comes to um, a CFO, we can't, there is no way I could go into my CFO and just say, oh, man, this is going to be so exciting. I have got Sam Gupta and we have hired him and he's going to come in and he is going to fix everything for us. And we're going to have this robust ERP and we're going to have a, you know, a CRM and everything. Obviously, I would be shot down and it would be like, what we're doing now seems to work. So you've got to do your plan, understand what you have. So for our company to go from 100 million or under to 200 million, we see some of those growth pains, okay? With do we have enough people? Do we have the right people? Do we have, and Sam, you've, you're a little familiar with our company. Do we have the right ERP system? We've opted to stay with an existing ERP system. Should we maybe now knowing what we know, and it's always in hindsight, should we maybe have stayed with the other or should we maybe have looked at some other things? But traditional SME companies, 
why would we want to, we already use this, it works. Why would we want to go spend $100,000 a year to either keep what this other company that we have acquired has or look at new things? What, that's not even in, in the realm of thought in some cases. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of time and training. So yes, we are right there at that huge impact where we are working as quickly as possible to correct some things that we see that we didn't have in place and then also perfect on some things that we did have in place some processes and things like that feeling okay. every bit of that pain but it's a great it's a great place to be in you just have to move very quickly very quickly okay amazing thank you so much Stephanie for sharing those thoughts and uh, Paul I know that you have been part of many different organizations you are probably going to be the guy who is going to be called first for the sales and operations plan before we can create the budget. Uh, and you have seen much larger organizations. You have seen the growing pains. And if you don't have the system and processes in place, it's going to be really hard for a company to be able to scale and move through those inflection points. So obviously, it's more of a chicken and an egg problem. Your finance guy is not going to sign the check because you don't really have some sort of vision or the, the pitch for the growth. And it may be harder unless you get some sort of money to be able to create yeah. that plan to be able to prove the point. So how would you approach this when you are creating, let's say, the system, the processes, the hiring plan, uh, when you go from 10 to 25 to 50 uh, to 100 million? Yeah, like what Aaron said, it's kind of a it's a convoluted answer. It's not a straight right out of the box kind of thing. It depends. First and foremost, know where you're going. Like Stephanie said, from under 100 million to over 200 million, it happened fast. And I'm assuming that's where you want it to be. Some companies, especially what I what I see on the smaller end, they're six million, seven million, maybe twenty one million, and all of a sudden there's it's a single owner who started it decades ago and says there's a chance I have an opportunity to sell as an exit strategy and be bought by a billion dollar conglomerate, and they see dollar signs. Well, immediately when that and one of my clients went through this, it went from seven million bucks to being acquired by somebody who's a billion dollar company with then a you know two hundred million dollar company was going to be the immediate parent company. They brought in all their systems. They said we're going to umbrella all the finance processes. We're going to umbrella everything that happens on the back end logistics wise. And we're going to do all these things, and and it's going to make your lives easier. All you need to do is do what you're good at and keep production going. And it was a nightmare. It was a stressful nightmare for the president, the vice presidents within the company. The owner thought he was just going to sell and exit, and really it turned out. What he was going to do is sell and then be asked to stay on board. All these moving parts, all these things are happening, right? And, and after a year when things started settling out and they were learning how to use SAP for a $7 million company with a, I think the system that they put in was probably a $70 million, you know, 10 times what their annual revenue. You don't, you don't need that, but it was forced on them. And when we really looked at why did all this happen and, and wasn't necessary, conversation went to, what did you what did you guys want to go to from 7 million and all, everybody's answer we wanted to get to 10 million repeatedly well now you're part of a billion dollar organization and you're just kind of one cog in the wheel and not that they weren't valued for the expertise in, in what they did and the products they made but their processes became so complex that that's where they spent all their time so their their cost to manage those things and then bring people on board skyrocket you know that went way up but their individual sales, the volume of product they were doing initially didn't didn't match, right? That lagged way behind. So now they were losing money. So all the hard work they did to get profitable at seven million was basically overnight gone. By the flip side of that, if you're a and I've been on the other side from the inside in a five hundred million dollar business, it was like we want to be one billion. We need to double. We're gonna change our process so we can double, triple, quadruple our volume. The planning stage was exactly what you're saying, Sam. We looked at what is the team going to have to be to run this like a billion dollar plant? What is What systems do we need to bring in? And it was all of our technology, our IT, our software, front and back end, all of it, we looked at and said, it's barely keeping up at 500 million. So it was a multi-year planning process of what new tools do we need to bring in? How do we qualify? How do we make sure it doesn't impact or interrupt production? Because if we lose a week of shipments, it's tens of millions of dollars on the line. If we flip the switch and the software goes, eh, you know, we're not, I'm not ready. So there was a huge multi-year planning process and that was appropriate where I think if, if you're, you know, part of a seven, 
to 10 or even 20 million, 20, uh, reaching that inflection point of $25 million company. If you're there and you're thinking about what new software do I need to help me grow? I, and so the point of, of everybody before me, I, I think it's that's the wrong question to be asking. Take a step back and say, okay, we're at 20x million. We're at 15. We want to be bigger. Why? How much bigger? Is the market even going to provide the demand for us to grow? And if we do, if we do get bigger, what do we have to fix internally first so we don't have to spend more money to grow? Because you can grow yourself right out of business. And so the, the, I guess the bottom line there is if you're small and independently run, not owned by an umbrella, larger company or a parent company, if your aspirations are to get bigger for the right reasons because you want more reach, more impact, higher, grow the team, all that kind of stuff. Make sure the market supports that first. And then if they do, make sure that if they flood you with all their demand and reward you with all those orders, that you can actually do it and do it without spending money to do it. And that's where I hope that they call me first to come in and look at what's your capacity, what's your process, what are your constraints, get into the throughput, get into your your theory constraints, get into your lean, whatever we got to do to make sure that we can handle more volume and do it and grow profitably from seven to 10 to 15 to 20 million, or from even 25 to 30 to 35 million. If you don't, if you grow to those numbers and you lose money doing it, you probably were better off not growing. So it really comes down to what do you want to be? Where, where, where do you want to go and why? And then, then look at, okay, do our current system support it? And if they, if they do, we don't have to spend a dime. But if you know your current systems don't, it probably, if you're at the $200 million size, you're having some serious conversations about maybe months of, of groundwork and planning and, and investment. And, and just quickly, Sam, what I would say um, yeah. from the standpoint of, I think companies need to look at their current state to growth to exit considerations when it comes to selection because a proper or improper selection of a digital system has a dramatic effect on valuation. Exactly. Right. And that's that's an important consideration that they need to make, because if they're coming to a point where they where you, let's say they take the SCP example for, that you put forth, Paul, if if you put SCP into a small company that's seven million, eight million, and then that parent company decides to sell off that seven million dollar company, it's now worth less because it's constrained by SAP. True. Sam, I would I would I would the simple way of saying you know, like if you what point of inflection is, is go around to the senior leaders of your team and ask them. And just look him in the eye and says, if we doubled sales, how would you feel? And whoever looks the most stressed is the one you need to talk to first. <laughs> and Aaron, and you just hit the nail on the head. That's it. You've got to be talking to the people, your senior leaders, and seeing what they bring, what they can tell you about their department. Because, of course, you know, my boss doesn't know everything I do. He's got to talk to me. They have to talk to the individuals there and understand what are your pain points if what you said just happens literally overnight. And tech is the last thing you put in. First thing you have to understand is, is the standard process and operation. And there could be some very low tech and very simple human solutions to that stuff. If, if you throw in, a, you throw in, that's why I'm very, very cautious with ERP. ERP is a magnifier. So in the finance terms, it's just like leverage. Right. So if you add debt, it's going to magnify. It's going to magnify your, your, your pros and it's going to magnify your cons. And so all, but it's so it's the old joke in, in finance land is listen, I, I, I only lose five cents on everything that I sell, but don't worry. I make it up in volume. If you can't figure that out. Then, you know, you got to go back to remedial math, but it's, and, and so I, I, I'm, I am the ultimate, not, I, I am the ultimate, I'm going to say skeptic when it comes to ERPs or any type of technological solution. I'm very, very cautious. Nail the operation, nail the operation. It, it, and, and this is the stuff that no one wants to talk about. Everyone looks at, oh, the night, new shiny toy, this ERP system. And there's a, there's a lot of slick, very impressive implementers out there. And I don't know if you've ever been through the sales process of some of these. It's, 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 it's oh, it's the demo. It's beautiful. So, Tim, I know that you have not spoken, yeah. so I'm actually going to lean to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, help me. I'm the manufacturing CFO here. I am struggling. Okay, yeah. that's my pain. That's my growing pain. I have yeah. a $10 million company here. I have no clue how to, how to grow this company to $25 million. And I'm coming to you. Okay, right. help me. How yeah. to take from... My inflection point, which is $10, $10 million, I have a lot of issues. I go to my sales. Sales complains about, you know, I'm not getting enough sales. Right. I go to my operations. Operations com complain about sales is not able to do anything. So what am I doing here? Okay. Uh, so I hear complaints from all the departments as the manufacturing executive or the manufacturing CFO. So obviously, my life is not easy. I'm coming to you, Tim. Help me here. 
So now yeah. on to you. <laughs> yeah. So first off, um, I come from a school of thought where if you're going to grow, you should look at that gap between where you are now on from a P&L statement or perspective and where you want to get to. So if you want to grow from 10 million to 25 million, okay, well, what's your you know cost of goods sold? What's your gross margin? What, what are your overall expenses? And really just plan that you should at least be spending that much money to grow the business to that point. So if you need to double your sales team, you have to double your IT budget, that shouldn't be a shock because that's what you're doing today. So to get to where you uh, need to be, it should at least be that. Um, now, I respectfully disagree. Well, says, but what happens is that once you get to that point, you should be able to actually back off on your expenses and have some some scale that has really played into your expenses so that you can reduce IT, reduce that spend. But from a budgeting standpoint, big picture, whether you're a $1 million company or companies I've been part of, almost you know, $500 million, that's how they look at it. From the board, they the board wants to know what's the worst case, not what's the best case, not what's touchy-feely. It's what's it really going to take to get us there? And it, there's a capital investment to, because for you to grow from 10 to $25 million, you're not going to be able to do it very easily with just you know a couple percent here, a couple percent there for capital. You need to have some real uh, investment in the business to grow to that point, which, you know, speaking to like a, a merger or an acquisition, that's what those are. People buy other companies because they're already there. And then they just really they're they're looking at saving on the expenses, the SDNA. And that's how they're going to maximize their profitability of those that, that grouping that, that the coming together of those businesses. Now, if you're if you're going organically, that's a different story. Organically, if you want to grow from 10 to 30, 40, 50 million dollars, that's a that's a pain point. Unless the market, like was spoken earlier, if the market is really loving you, then the money is going to come in. But you need to be able to keep up with that demand. And you know, going into the say the the warehouse side of things, the automation side of things. Yeah, we have lots of cool toys out in the the space right now. But the the basic building block is what's your process? If you don't have a documented process and you don't know what it takes to fulfill an order or to manufacture a part. You get through all the fancy bells and whistles you want at it. It's just going to amplify, just like a, an ERP system. It's just going to amplify your problem, and uh, you know, really, you're you're not going to get anywhere. You're actually going to be wasting cash and capital and not being as productive. So, really, you know, you got to know what that process is. So, even like you know, ten million dollars to twenty million, you need to be looking at what is what are the what's the real work that's being done, and how do we how do we support it? Well, well Tim, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit the slope of your the slope of your or the ratio of your expenses to your revenue should sh- shrink over time meaning that there should you should you should increase in margin over time if you are if you came to me and say listen i want to double in size but i want to have my margin the net effect is nothing so well, that's what happens though when you when you grow in volume i mean any big organization you see that that margin start to creep down you know manufacturers that have 30 40 50% margin on a product once they get to a certain point they know that their that margin is going to drop because of a competitive landscape. You know, now they're competing with more people, and, they're and that volume. They're, they're competing with the same people before. I mean, uh, if, you're always, talk, if you're talking about if you're talking about any type of expansion, and for granted, I understand that you got to amortize the the capital expense over time. Yes, yeah, so I'm not. I so so now from a cash on cash perspective, but it goes back. What's the purpose of growth? If you if you if you cut my margin to the point in which the 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 net effect the net, the the net is so much lower with the larger scale it's not worth growing uh, the, the, it, the purpose of growth is profit so even if you're growing if your margin's decreasing your profit over time is still getting bigger so it's not that oh we've doubled our company and we're getting half the the net you know the net profit um you should be somewhere in between and, and likely on the higher end but it really depends on you know how fast you're growing if you can control your growth if you can grow 5% a year, by all means, your expenses, they're going to keep shrinking and shrinking relative to you know the, your revenue. But if you're growing from 10 to $20 million, well, you better come with a big checkbook to make that happen because it's not going to happen very easily. Just you know, throwing a little bit here and a little bit there. You really have to do it with intention to see those kinds of results and be willing to make major changes in an organization. You know, That's going to require maybe different people, different executives, different leadership. Just It's all across the board. Just a, a different way of doing it. Can I jump in? Does any of yeah. this matter? Any of the financial part of it? I, I know it all matters, but does any of that matter, or is it going to be significant if we don't 
know the people that are, are working in these segments and talk to them about our plan the, from a senior level, what that plan is, have processes in place. If there's no processes in place, if there's no communication, if there's no real, uh, I'm going to call them steering teams or things set up to get us from point A to point B, talking about the people that we're going to need, the technology that we're going to need, the um, the processes maybe that'll, that are going to be, need to be enhanced or changed, then in my opinion, can set ourselves up for failure. And the, the end result is we're not going to be making any money. And I can't remember if you said it, Aaron or Tim or Paul, somebody said what was so perfect we can pretty much grow ourselves out of business. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can grow so fast that we cannot keep up. We cannot handle. We ruin our company's reputation, whether you're an e-com or whatever. You can't fulfill the orders. And then none of the rest of it matters at all because we can still limp along and make a little bit of money. But that growth killed us instead of making us really grow. And I think it's also about those inflection points also have a lot to do with the people in developing the people too. It's it's a plan for the company to grow, but I think people play a huge part. And I think that's something that gets left out. Management by spreadsheet is a guaranteed failure. Yeah. Unless you're a PE shop and you're just doing bolt on acquisitions and planning on selling it to another firm. (laughs) Then you might be very successful financially. Well, Uh, we're owned by a private equity company, the company that -hmm. that, uh, I work for, and we are on a heavy just grow, 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 baby. And we're doing it and we're we're doing it well. But we're also feeling a lot of these when we went from 85 million or 50 million to 85 three years ago, and then 85 bumped up to, you know, 100. Now 100's at 200. And there's two more down the pipeline. So things are really growing really fast. And you do, you feel that pain. But that takes a very strong executive team leadership Mm-hmm. to be doing this planning with the right senior leadership or or things happen like we've talked about before a new maybe new CEO comes in to help maybe you know there's different things that happen in in our company we have a new CEO that's that's coming in that's going to help us help us make that growth you know because we're growing so quickly and we're just not used to it so Ryan, uh, I think you have spoken the least, and I want to make sure that everybody is contributing equally. Um, do you want to share any thoughts so far on the discussion? No, I, I think that the points are valid. I think that that everyone's kind of hit it hit on the head in, in, in their own way. I, I think you know I'm, I'm a big believer in good strategy, bad strategy. I think a bad strategy is to plan too far ahead without looking at the incremental steps that will support that growth. And and like Stephen, like you said, if you don't if you don't support the support buy-in by determining motivations of the players involved, then that's a step for failure right there. Like you're going to have your people, all the people process and, and, and that kind of thing. People are the most important. And if your people aren't buying in, you know, they won't, pardon the phrase, but they won't haul ass for you. And ultimately there's going to be some, there's going to be a trip up at some point. And I think that when you look at the, the good strategy versus the bad strategy, you look at these coherent actions that are the, the result of kind of looking at what our current SWOT analysis is versus our future SWOT analysis, and then determining these incremental baby steps that support that growth, I think you're thinking way too far ahead. And I think that you you ultimately trip because you haven't put that foundation down that's necessary. Okay, amazing. Uh, Paul, do you have any 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 thoughts at all? I think you have not spoken for some time now. Yeah, thanks, Sam. You know, it's in, in, Tim, you touched on something really interesting about uh, as you're as you are growing, there's a chance margins are going to shrink over time, right? And, I, and, and we do see that in a lot of businesses. I think where that where it does happen is when the market is price competitive and maybe they, they move either into a new market with different players who are a lot tighter on price and they're like, we've got to just break our way in. We, we need 10, 15, 20% of this market to get a foothold. But that's to the point about good strategy versus bad strategy, right? That may be a very good strategy to sacrifice margin by going into a a lower price market, but just getting market share and growing that way. The other way to look at it, too, which I think a lot of people miss in manufacturing, is the opportunity to actually go the reverse and be able to increase your prices or increase the product offering and tack on things. Maybe if your organization can do it and at a 10 10 million go into the 25 million inflection point. I think looking at tacking on either service, if it's in-house or out in field, if that's appropriate for your business, those are ways to scale the dollars coming in. And maybe it requires hiring a team or upskilling the people you have to be able to support it. But that's going to 
be a small, small uh, percentage of what you may bring in on the on the upside. So looking at increasing revenue, just not by units or volume, but by price per unit and an additional, I hate the term upsell, but additional kind of common language accepted, right? Upsell. What can you tack on that's valuable to that market? Because if, if you're 10 million bucks in manufacturing, chances are you're niche. You're not, you're not a worldwide household name, right? You might feed into a supply chain of people that everyone's heard of, but they haven't heard of you. But if you look at ways to say, well, that my supply chain customer downstream, who then, you know, is three steps removed from the point of sale, they may actually need me to do more in-house quality work or more in-house service or something out in the field that we can provide their service team with that makes them better. And you sell that stuff. And that's a fast way. I don't want to say fast and it's never easy, right? But if, if that's your strategy and you execute well, months within months, maybe a year, you can go from five, six, seven million, cross that 10 million threshold. You can go from 10 to 20 million in a year or two with that kind of a strategy and it's and your margin's going to explode. When you look at just calculating basically sales minus all your costs just to be crude, your, your, your cash flow should improve. But if you're not concerned about that, your bottom line is definitely going to outgrow your expenses. But it's a it's an overlooked strategy in, in small manufacturers because it's kind of that's the that's the rub. A ten million dollar company's going, we make this part. And if we try to make two different parts, you know, a second skew, our heads will explode because that to them, then the day to day, that's hard. And I don't want to say that it's not, but unfortunately, they're not, they're not, the right people aren't coming in to help them to say, well, what if we charge more? What if we do, what, what if we expand our SKU offering or shrink it, but it increases the value that we're providing and allows us to charge more? We can grow by 20% a year. And, and by 20%, I mean grow top line and bottom line by a significant percentage. And it's an overlooked strategy. It's an underused strategy because I think the small companies get so uh, so focused, right? They have sort of that tunnel vision on, we just got to make the parts we make and make them better. And uh, it's hard to get them out of that conversation because they've been in it sometimes for decades. But if you can, or if you find someone to Stephanie's point too, right? Talk to the people on the different teams. You might discover that that idea is already there. And it's you're, you're one or two steps away from it just taking off. So to the point of good strategy versus bad, it all ties to where are you actually, what do you want to do? Do you want to go from 10 to 20 million or from 20 to 50? If you do, that's cool. What's your strategy to do it? If your strategy is just blast the market with volume, that might not be good, but it really depends on on the market and, and who your customers are. But you know, when you start there, you can find very low cost ways to, to scale rapidly and significantly. Yep. And that's the hidden benefit to Stephanie's situation is that you can kind of prey upon the hype, right? If you if, if a larger company, a large multinational buys a small company, then you could kind of there's implied value, and therefore you can mm-hmm. there, there's an implication that your product is now more valuable than it was. So a price increase is is, is okay. Good point. So Stephanie, I'm actually gonna go back to you about your story. So you seem to be happy overall with the growth, the way your company has grown overall, the the way the processes has been there. Now let's say if this were your company, okay? Now you are the the executive, you are running your own company. Okay, okay, and you are taking it from the journey of let's say 10 to 20 to 50 to 100. And let's say if you could go back in time, okay, and if you were to fix something, what are some of the things that you are going to do to make sure? I don't know if you have had any sort of growing pains, I can almost guarantee that you had because everybody oh. faces okay. So, if you had, what are going to be some of the planning or strategies that you are going to consider to make sure that you are not going to face those growing pains? So in my opinion and by my experience as well, um, a lot of small companies, whether they're small or that small, medium size, okay, you get into this mentality of, well, you've got tribal knowledge and we all know what to do and there's no need to write anything down. The process is you do X, Y, and Z and that's done. Now we can move on to the next thing. It's not written anywhere. So you grow a little bit bigger and the process becomes X, Y, Z, and then one. and we now just have more tribal knowledge and we continued down that path. So if it were my company and I was growing rapidly, number one, we'd have standard operating procedures for every department, whether that be we hire someone to come in and do this for the company, whether this be every senior leader of the team, the procurement, senior director of procurement, senior director of finance, whatever. We all write our processes that's okay. But somebody has to have these written processes to begin with to know 
where are we at today? I had somebody recently tell me, uh, a lot smarter than me, said, you know, you've got to do that as is, should be kind of situational analysis where this is where we are and you got to write it down. You've got to look at it and go, but this is where we want to be. So it is a lot of work. Without that, I believe as a company grows, you're dead in the water. Then you also have to empower the people and talk to the people. If the people in your organization do not know that you're in a real growth mode, other than waking up one morning and seeing possibly an email that says, oh, guess what? We're, we're doing great. We just bought a company. And that happens in a lot of small companies. Guess, you know, guess what? We just we just grew by 10, 10 million dollars. They they don't know what to think. Does my job change? Do I get a promotion? What does this mean for me? Do I have to keep using this because now I'm going to have 10 more spreadsheets I'm going to have to do? So so people processes. And, and I do really think the technology part plays a big, big deal. And obviously, you've got to have that CFO buy in. But I really believe from a technology standpoint, all of your top leaders should be in there. I do not believe that the just because they have the title of CEO or president or COO, they should necessarily be the person making that decision. In a lot of companies, that's what you see. CEO has a great demo, likes the sales guy, likes the saleswoman, whoever, looks good. The other people sit at the team, the leadership team and go, yes. And then me, I implement it and I struggle with the implementation because it doesn't work the way we wanted it to work. And they didn't and possibly they didn't ask me or I didn't ask Susie what she thought because she's using it every day. Hope that answers. 100 percent. Yeah. Uh, guys, so we have three minutes in the show right now. I want to make sure that everybody is able to cover the closing comments right now. So, Aaron, do you want to start with your closing comments? Uh, yeah, I'll go back to what I said before is. Finance, while incredibly important in the process, is the latter half of the process. If you don't have your act, if you don't know what your processes are and what you need from an outcome and operational perspective, it's going. You're you're almost guaranteed to fail. Don't be seduced by management by spreadsheet. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Aaron. Tim, do you want to share your closing comments? Yeah, I would say that um, no matter what inflection point you're at in your business, um, it really takes great leadership. And then also, you know, shout out to Aaron on the finance side. You know, that great leadership needs to cast that vision and work with finance to make it happen. So, you know, that's that is a collaborative effort of, you know, knowing, hey, this is where we need where where we are, this is where we want to go. How do we get there? What do the numbers look like? So, yeah. And, you know, connecting those people, process and tech, that's all part of that process. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Uh, Tim. Ryan, you have not spoken for a while. Do you want to share your closing comments? Yeah, I would say that there's two things. Just to summarize, I think people need to understand that that technology is cement, right? It's going to pour cement over whatever exists currently. It's going to and it's going to be really hard to jackhammer that technology away if you want to get to a process that is broken. So that's one one thing. And the second thing is is all about understanding motivations. I think that it's such a it's such a massive key to understand the motivations of everyone involved. That yes, you know these things to to get the buy in, you need the motivation, and to get the motivation. You need to communicate to understand what the motivations are. So it really does boil down to those incremental steps and forming a, you can form as massive a foundation as you want, but they need to be comprised of little incremental, like I hate to use the word agile because, you know, as a supply chain guy, I don't want to think that way, but most certainly you want to think of these incremental baby steps and form that massive foundation full of kind of smaller uh, pieces. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan. And we just have one minute right now and we need to close this. Paul, do you want to cover in 10 seconds your closing thoughts? Yeah, this was an awesome panel. You guys are fun. I learned something from each and every one of you. So this is cool. I, I I would do it again in a, in, a, in a heartbeat. So I guess when it comes to the topic of inflection and inflection points, anyone listening to this, if they haven't heard Sam's podcast episode with Jim that he goes through it, oh, it's awesome. gold. It's really, really informative. Check it out. And then if you're a decision maker in a company and you're between two inflection points or just reaching one, uh, like everybody here said, is really decide do you want to get to the next one or have you nailed it and mastered it at the inflection point you're at? And if the answer to that second question is no, stay where you are and, and get better at that first. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, 10 seconds, Stephanie, do you want to share any closing Don't thoughts? Be afraid. Don't be afraid to outsource. You got people here on this panel you can outsource to. So let the ego go. We don't all know it all. So outsource <laughs> to people that can help you. And just because it's broken doesn't mean it can't be fixed. You can still, there are many of us out there going through the pain. You can fix it. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for for that. And guys, I mean, I learned so much from all of you. 
regarding inflection points. So thank you so much for joining and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Aaron, head over to aventusag.com. It's E-V-E-N-T-U-S-A-G.com. If you want to learn more about Stephanie, head over to pridesports.com. It's P-R-I-D-E-S-P-O-R-T-S.com. If you want to learn more about Tim, head over to warmcommerce.com. It's W-A-R-M-C-O-M-M-E-R-C-E.com. If you want to learn more about Ryan, head over to changeconnect.ca. It's C-H-A-N-G-E-C-O-N-N-E-C-T dot C-A. If you want to learn more about Paul, head over to paulserafino.com. It's P-A-U-L-S-E-R-A-F-I-N-O dot com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Jim Gidney from Group 50, who shares his thoughts on each inflection points for companies and what they need to know to identify them and move to the next by making necessary changes. Also, the interview with Mark Jeffy from Strategic Growth Consulting, who discusses how macroeconomic trends impact consumer behaviors. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.